Hello and welcome to season two of Inside the Therapy Room. I'm your host, Sam Sellers. I'm a registered therapist, a wife and a fur mama, and I am passionate about breaking down the barriers and stigma attached to therapy. I want to begin by first honouring the traditional custodians of the land we live and work on. Today, Bronwyn is on the land of the Paramonk people and Sam is on Gundungurra land. We pay our respects to the elders past, present and emerging for they hold the memories, the traditions and cultures of our First Nations people. We must always remember that the land below our feet is, was and always will be Aboriginal land. Today we are chatting to Bronwyn Bickle. In her private practice, she specialises in ethical non-monogamy and chronic illness. She feels passionately about providing a service that is positively aligned with the neurodivergent, LGBTQI+, kink and BDSM communities. 2022 saw the release of her first book, The Beginner's Guide to Ethical Non-Monogamy. Today's episode is all about the wonderful world of ethical non-monogamy and polyamory relationships. We hope you enjoy joining us inside the therapy room. Welcome, Bronwyn. Thanks for joining me. Thanks, Sam. I'm so happy um, to finally have somebody for this episode. Um, So this episode is all about ethically non-monogamous relationships or polyamory and anything that's fitting into um, a diverse relationship structure or out of the sort of monogamous um, normative of relationships in society, which I'm so excited about. For the people who have absolutely no idea what any of that is, what is ENM or polyamory? Yeah, it's a lot of new words for people that haven't come across yes. it. Um, ethical non-monogamy is like an umbrella term, right? It's an overall generalised term that's an alternative to monogamy. So we hear about monogamy a lot. That's the general um relationship dynamic that we all know about, that we're all raised with. We see it in media so much. Uh, which is just about picking one person and you date that person. Um, Generally, it's with the long-term goal of longevity. You know, this relationship is going to last us forever. With ethical non-monogamy, it sort of encompasses everything that might fall outside of that. Mm -hmm. So the ethical part is that everybody involved understands what's going on and they agree to it, they consent to it. Mm -hmm. And non-monogamy just suggests that it's not one partner you might have, you might have multiple partners. That's just the overall umbrella term. You might hear it called consensual non-monogamy as well. Mm -hmm. Um, I prefer ethical non-monogamy because I think it's very, very clear what it's about. And we get to shorten it to ENM, which makes it so much easier. (laughs) And I think... (laughs) Words. Yes, Absolutely. And ethical, I think, encompasses much more than just consent, right? You know, it's not just, you know, when we say consensual, you know, we just think that everybody is aware of what's going on. But I I would imagine that ethical is encompassing much more than that. Um, Communication and, you know, the way that things are talked about as well, I would expect. And it's also uh, the understanding that everybody involved will have all of the information they need in order to consent and that doesn't always happen Um, it's not really consensual if some of the information is being withheld from certain members of the dynamic yeah so you know it's really about making sure everybody involved understands and has all of the information they need in order to make a choice about the relationship structure that is right for them yeah okay Um, and so how does Ethical non-monogamy or ENM, let's just put it out there. We're going to shorten it because otherwise this podcast is going to go for a very long time. Mm -hmm. Um, How is that different or similar to what is largely used as polyamorous when it comes to non-monogamous relationships? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's important to recognise that people will use the terms differently. Um, Everyone has a different understanding of what it is, what it means to them, and they'll use whatever language feels right to them. Um, We do have some overall labels that we use just to help the rest of us kind of understand it, 
to yeah. help people who have never been in that space kind of maybe transition into it. It's like a starting point. Mm. Uh, but certainly if you're working with clients in this space, they might have their own language that they prefer to use around it. Yeah. And, of course, there's people that don't want to label anything at all. So, um, you know, it's important to uh, respect people's views on these things. Mm. Generally speaking, when we talk about polyamory, we're looking at relationships with people, that emotional connection with somebody. Mm -hmm. Generally, it'll be a sexual connection as well. That's an individual choice, but it'll be that emotional connection to someone. So it's building a longer term relationship that's really similar to monogamy. You're just doing it with multiple people. Yeah. So there's lots of other forms like an open relationship. You Mm -hmm. might already be in a partnership with somebody and then you decide maybe there's something like sexual needs that you'd like to have met elsewhere. Mm -hmm. Um, So you have that initial relationship, but then you have other partners for sexual experiences. Um, Swingers is one we've heard about before uh, where a couple might go and seek out sexual experiences together or separately with other couples Yep. Yeah, so it's sort of, you know, it depends on what the purpose or the goal of the relationship would be as to what kind of label we'd start using around it. Yeah. What? How did you find yourself working in this space? I'm one of the lucky ones, <laughs> and I always say this because my niche chose me. Yes. I, I've i found, you know, in all of the... Um, interviews that I've been doing is that everybody's sort of niche has happened quite naturally, I've found. And for some, it was even sort of, you know, resisting, I don't want that to be my niche. I don't want it, you know, and it happens anyway. So, um, yeah. Universe handing you something. I know. And, you know, this is your area. Yeah, Yeah. it was a funny one because when you go into private practice, the, the overall uh, recommendation was to find a niche because it makes yeah. it easier for clients to find the right therapist for them. Yeah. Um, and so while I was sort of mulling that over and trying to understand what what areas could I work in, where, where do my skills lie, most of the people booking in were in some sort of alternate style relationship. The dynamic of their relationship was outside of that what we call mononormative. Yeah. You know, the heterosexual sort of monogamous relationship style. So it was just sort of that slow realisation that, uh, you know, I don't know why, but this kind of community is coming and finding me and signing up with me, mm. who's settling into that and understanding it better. And, you know, it has been the most amazing opportunity to yeah. work in that I would never have imagined that was a niche that I could work in. Mm. So have them seek me out. I mean, there's obviously a need for therapists that can sit in that space with people and um, support them. Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Are you finding that uh, some of the people that are coming to you have had perhaps some not so helpful um, experiences with traditional relationship therapists who maybe don't understand this space? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I find there's a couple of things that go on there. One of them is people who already have a a longer-term therapist, someone they've been working with for a Mm -hmm. while, and they feel like they can talk about, you know, their trauma, their past, their childhood, all of that sort of thing. But when it comes to relationships now or into the future, they don't really feel comfortable mentioning yeah. ENM. They just don't feel like their therapist is going to be open to that or understand it. Mm. And then unfortunately, there's quite a big group of people who have sought out a therapist wanting to talk to them about ENM of some variety, and they've had a really negative experience. So that's when a therapist is sort of saying to them, relationships, you're doing it wrong. Like yeah. you need to be monogamous or trying to make it sound like their trauma from their past is somehow linked to wanting a different style of relationship. Yeah, okay. So these people are kind of coming into counselling sort of saying, look, you know, here's the situation I'm in. I've already had these negative experiences, Mm. which is huge. To have a negative experience and then try and seek out counselling again, it, it just, you know, there's a huge amount of courage in that. 
Yeah, absolutely. It is one of the most vulnerable places that you can go to for that to then um, be an unpleasant time or to be shamed about something. Um, To then seek that out again is, you know, superhuman in my opinion. (laughs) Yeah, um, it astounds me that people find that courage to come forward again and try and find somebody again. Absolutely. Yeah. Why do you think there is such a stigma attached to anything outside of a monogamous relationship? My goodness, what a huge question. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Society? <laughs> yeah, I know. Oh, Society I- sucks, right? <laughs> it's tough. <laughs> We're trying to yeah. change it. We're giving it a crack. We're getting yeah, it. yeah. You know, anything that falls outside of the mainstream, the the generalized, this is what you should be doing with your life. Mm. Whether it's your relationship structure or some other part of who you are or what you want to achieve in your life, anything that falls outside of that is then looked down upon. Like you know, yeah. you're doing that wrong. The way you're going about these things is wrong. You need to be doing what everyone else is doing. Yeah. Just not true. And we know that about relationship structures. These sorts of different styles of structures in relationships have been around since the dawn of time. It's, yes. not, a, it's not a new thing that's popped up as a fad or yeah. a trend. It, they've been around forever. So yeah. I think it's societal. You know, when something falls outside of those social norms or those social expectations, including family, including religion, including the community you grow up in, yeah. You know, it, it's hard for other people to understand why you would want something different. Yeah. Yep. It creates discomfort and the unknown creates that discomfort. I think it's sort of that fear of anything that is outside of your norm. Um, and we've seen it with other social groups, you know. Absolutely. So I, I don't feel like the ENM community is any. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. And it's, I mean, I was sort of saying to you before, it's much more common than what people think, right? You know, this is not a, like, obviously, you know, when we talk about, um, often when I talk about um, sexuality or gender and things like that, and we, you know, we understand that they are minority groups, but the minority is not as minority as what people think, (laughs) right? (laughs) Yeah. It's not a small minority. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And ENM has been around since the dawn of time. Yes. It's not, you know, there's a real narrative in media at the moment about it being a trend, especially amongst younger people. Yeah. That this is just the the fad, you know, the trendy thing to be doing. Yeah. And you know, there's such complex relationship types. Mm. It takes so much energy and communication and understanding to exist in these relationship styles. I don't know that anyone's really doing it because they think they're being trendy. Like a lot of output for something you feel is a trend. Absolutely. And I think often I find that when things become a trend, it really is just that we have new language around it and people are talking about it, which is that's only a good thing, to be honest. You know, I think that can only be a, um, a good thing. But often it's just that we have new terminology that is, you know, relatable. I've found for people that that ENM terminology was just something that was um, much more, um, they had a more connection with that terminology than polyamory or, you know, things like that. And so I think, you know, having language creates conversation and when there's conversation, suddenly we have trends happening. <laughs> So, yeah. and it is, you know, ENM has been in the yeah. media a lot more just in the last sort of yeah. two, three years. There's mm. a lot more people discussing it and and sort of in mainstream conversations. Yeah. You know, it, it's not a trend, but it is something we're talking about more openly now. Yeah, absolutely. ENM relationships or polyamory relationships, what sort of things are coming up in the room? It's such an individual thing, you know. Some people are coming into counselling because the relationship style has hit some uh, speed bumps Mm -hmm. or there's some specific challenges coming up around that that we can work with. 
And sometimes it might just be that they're wanting a counsellor that they don't have to justify themselves to and they don't have to educate. Yeah. Um, sitting with a counsellor who's saying, I know nothing about ENM mm. and this person saying, but here's my relationship styles. Yeah. You know, for the client, that's a lot of time and, and money and energy put into trying to educate their own therapist about who they are in this this part of their lives. Yeah. So it's sort of really diverse, the things that people come into counselling for in that space. I mean, it really could be any area of life. It doesn't necessarily have to be specific to the relationship structure. Yeah, okay. I um, wholeheartedly agree about not feeling like you need to educate your therapist, and I think that is part of, I guess, what um, led to the creation of this podcast was wanting people to be able to find a therapist who either works with their particular presentation or issue that they're wanting to explore um, Mm -hmm. or works in a way that um, is relatable for them um, Mm -hmm. because, um, you know, my specialty is religious trauma and so I understand Um, the difficulty in finding a therapist who you don't have to censor or filter the type of language that you use. I don't need to be like, oh, yeah, sorry, I forgot. I need to tell you, like, Mm -hmm. what that terminology means. There is an ease about it when you have a therapist who understands the terminology or the language that you're speaking. Um, And I would imagine that some of the terminology um, would be new for a lot of therapists. Mm. And I think it's important to remember, and even if you have therapists who are listening to this podcast, all the different themes that you cover, Mm. if you're hearing certain topics, certain counselling themes, certain niches, that you're just not interested in, that don't align with who you are as an individual, that you feel you don't know enough about, it's yeah. okay to refer clients on and it's okay to Absolutely. be honest with clients and say, you know, I'm not sure if we're the right fit at, at the moment. It, the, it doesn't mean you're less of a counsellor. It doesn't mean you're not a good therapist. Yeah. In fact, being able to understand the gaps in your knowledge and your skill set is a strength. Absolutely. Yeah. What uh, I would I would imagine that there would be a a need for this service, and what I mean by this service, as in practitioners who specialize in this, because I would imagine there would be conversations for currently monogamous relationships who are wanting to potentially open up their relationship or who are having conversations around. Um, E&M and going, how do we navigate this? Yeah, a thousand percent. Yeah. Is yeah. that, uh, what is that like for the the people in those relationships? To it's be scary. Yeah. It's scary. It's scary to be in a monogamous relationship, a relationship type, a dynamic, and then have the other person sort of turn around and like, I, I think I might require something a bit different or I think I might be interested in exploring something outside of this yeah. it's terrifying you know and we're not we're not ready for that we're not we, there's no uh, discussions in society around what happens when your relationship starts to change what happens when your partner requires something that you are not ready to offer them what yeah. if they have wants and needs that don't fit into our current relationship structure so it's it's not uncommon for people reaching out at that point where there's some sort of conversation coming up around moving from a monogamous relationship into EM mm. potentially. Um, or they've already kind of shifted into it and now they're just needing some support. Yeah. But it's a terrifying space for people. It's really scary. That that threat to their security in their relationship is huge. Mm. And I think, you know, it, is that sort of lack of security, a misconception about non-monogamous relationships that you don't get that um, in a non-monogamous relationship because often we think, you know, security and commitment and stability are all of the things that we associate with, 
you know, having a relationship with one person. Um, But we know that you can still have all of those things. But I'm wondering, is that a a bit of a misconception or a fear of people um, who are hearing that their partner wants to have this discussion? Yeah. Um, you know, how much do we go into it today? It's such an in-depth yeah. kind of topic. But the the place that my brain goes immediately with it is to attachment. Yeah. The way that we connect with other human beings, and, and in this discussion we're talking about partners, um, the way we connect to them is called attachment, and there's multiple different attachment styles. Um you know, there's a secure attachment, fantastic, no problems, but a bucket load of us have insecure attachment styles. Um, we're worried our partner's going to leave us, so we're, we're reaching out for them, trying to connect to them, and, and we're having a lot of anxiety around them maybe not being as into us, they're going to leave us. Mm. Uh, and then you have attachment styles where the partner might be pulling away and, and not wanting to connect deeply because they're scared of that connection or they don't know how to do that. Yeah. Um, these sorts of things that can come up in, in partners, in partnerships, can happen in monogamous relationships and they can happen in non-monogamous relationships. It doesn't mean one style of relationship is better than the other. Yeah. It's about the individuals that are participating in it and the connection that they have together, that attachment to each other. Mm. And certainly the counselling space is a great space to unpack that and kind of understand how those two people are relating to each other. Mm. So, you know, I think that's a big sort of um, myth about the difference between monogamous relationships Mm. and E&M relationships, that um, monogamous relationships are somehow more secure and that if there's bumps in the road or somebody uh, realises they have different needs or something's going on, that that suddenly makes that relationship really insecure and scary. But it doesn't It doesn't have to be that way. Those sorts of things can come up in any relationship structure. Yeah, absolutely. Are we getting misconceptions about E&M and polyamory because of the way that it is presented in the media? and in TV shows or movies or things like that? Yeah, that's a great question. I would probably say it comes more from those societal fears of what this is exactly. People are quick to judge it if they don't understand it and, and find the flaws in it. Yeah. Um, you know, media in general, movies, TV, they're starting to explore e a lot more and in more balanced ways. It's not sort of, um, I don't know if you remember a TV show from a while back called Big Love, uh, which was about polygamy, uh, which is quite different again. Yeah. So, you know, the more diverse examples we can see, the more understanding I think society at large will have of these different types of relationships and how they can work really well for some people. Yeah, absolutely. I think there is a real, I mean, we might be going slightly on a tangent, but (laughs) um, I I feel like there is a real need. I mean, we talk about representation a lot and the fact that, you know, Um, representation matters and that when we see things in the media and we see relationships or people like us um, that it makes a world of difference Um, but I think there is a real um, push and pull that's happening in regards to do we put this in because um, I know um I mean, most people will know the TV show Neighbours in Australia and even the UK probably know it more than Australia, but um, there was um, an ethically non-monogamous relationship in that show Um, and, oh, my gosh, the the heat and the flack that they got for putting um, something like that on a family show. And so it's it's a little bit like that sort of push and pull that's happening of, um, you know, there is the push to, to include these aspects and these parts of society and these relationships in society that are existing so that there is representation. 
but there is such um, division still in regards to it. Um, Mm -hmm. And so, you know, is there, is the, you know, I was talking to a sex therapist about the role that the media plays in regards to, you know, people's sessions and things like that. Is the media coming up in conversations for people in regards to their relationship? Only in a sense of there being a lack of representation. Mm. Um, And we talk about it in terms of role modelling. We don't really have a role model for ethical non-monogamy, an example of here's one way of how it could work and it's going well, it works for these people. Yeah. Um, and I think that's really difficult when you're in a in a some sort of community that doesn't have representation, it, it's in, extremely invalidating, you yeah. know, that that experience of being completely othered, you know, yeah. you're on the outside of society then. And any conversations that come up around it, like you're saying, there's a lot of backlash to it and yeah. a lot of negative connotations around it, a lot of negative conversations happening. And I just think the the damage to individuals that that does is huge. Yeah. You know, just because they're a minority group doesn't mean there's anything wrong taking place there. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. What do people need to know about E&M? What is, you know, if there was one thing that you wanted people to know about E&M, what would it be? Oh, there's not just one thing. <laughs> there's a hundred different things. <laughs> I think a good place to start would be that these relationships can work. Yeah. These relationships can be healthy, functioning, amazing connections for people. Doesn't mm-hmm. mean it's right for everyone and that's okay. Just yeah. like monogamy is amazing and works for a lot of people, doesn't mean it's for everybody. Mm-hmm. You know, I think having that open-mindedness that, some people do have the capacity to love and adore multiple people at the same time or they have a capacity to hold a primary relationship but also have sexual connections on the side. Yeah. Some people have capacity for I don't know where they get the energy, but some people have the capacity for it. <laughs> Emotional maturity to have these conversations yeah. with multiple partners. They have the time available to them. You know, they have brain space to be able to put this somewhere in their life, and yeah. that's okay. And yeah. it's not expected of everyone. You don't have to want to be in an ethically non-monogamous relationship. That's okay too. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, it, it's funny because it's so simplistic in that, you know, if you want it, go for it, and if you don't, don't. You know, it is as simple as that. But, you know, the reality is, is that people do get caught up in the in the finer details and it's like, you know, let's just pull it back to the simplistic nature of if you like something, you do it. And if you don't, then you don't. And just make sure that everybody is aware and well-informed that if it involves other people. Uh, But I think there's so much in getting to that point, you know, because of the backgrounds we all come from, the the different things that contribute to who we are. Even just getting to that point of, you know what, here's a thing that I want. Mm. Everyone's an adult. Everyone's consenting. Technically, there's nothing wrong with this. Yeah. But I also come from a society that says it's wrong. Yeah. There's a lot of work that people end up doing on themselves just to get to that place of accepting that, no, I can have a different type of relationship style if that's what I feel works for me. Yeah, absolutely. Some people never get there. Some people want to get there. Like they cognitively they can understand that these relationships can be fantastic and healthy, Mm. but they just can't get there emotionally. It just they can't find a way to be okay with polyamory or swinging or an open relationship. Mm. You know, there's a real internal struggle that can happen for a lot of people. Yeah, yeah. I have very much found that in those who have come from faith backgrounds or who have come um, through childhood indoctrination or have been part of organised religion or something like that. And there is this almost instinctual internal part of yourself to reject something 
even if you logically know that it's okay and that there's nothing wrong um, and that, um, I mean, that's not just specific to e or anything like that, but um, it is, it can be a very visceral barrier for people to, to try and move through. Um, and like you said, not everybody does uh, because yeah. it is and can be such a complex and difficult um, journey to navigate how to sort of move. Like you say, it's that internal, there's like a pull mm. or, or a barrier of like, no, that's outside of what I was told. Yeah. And even though cognitively you can understand a concept, whether it's e or something else, that's some other part of life. Yeah. It doesn't mean internally that you're going to be able to balance that out. Yeah. Um, and for some people, there's a lot of work that goes into trying to offset the old stuff and understand the new stuff. Mm, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, the podcast is called Inside the Therapy Room. So for those who are in e m relationships or who are polyamorous or who are having conversations with their current monogamous partner, what is it like in the room with you? It's safe. It's calm. Yep. Um, there's a lot of facilitating conversations if you come in as a couple that are wanting to, to talk through these things. Um, I think for me as a therapist, the main thing is making people feel safe. Yeah. Because you're probably not going to be comfortable. My job isn't to make you comfortable. My job is to support you in sitting with the uncomfortable feelings that come up, the uncomfortable conversations that take place. But as long as you feel you're sitting in a safe space to be able to have those discussions, I think that's the most important thing. It doesn't always happen in the first session. You know, it can take a while for some clients to gain trust in you, that they can speak openly about these topics and that you won't be rejecting of it. You won't deny that part of them. You won't tell them they're wrong, um, that they can openly have these discussions out loud with you and that you can hold that space for them so for me creating that space for clients is really the most important part they're yeah. not going to share with you if they don't feel safe yeah absolutely and is there room I guess for everybody involved in the relationship to come in for appointments yeah it's a tricky one isn't it because <laughs> These groups can get pretty big. Yes, they can. <laughs> of people yeah. together. Um, for me at the moment, you know, I do a lot of online counselling. So I work with people from all over Australia and a few extra countries from around the world. Um, and we do that up to couples. Once we get to three people or more, it really is more beneficial if we can all sit in the same space together. So I'm up in the Adelaide Hills. If people want to be able to access the counselling service with three or more people, that would be the option, having face-to-face counselling. And it's only because the dynamic is more and more complex the more people we add into it. Yeah. It's important that everybody feels safe and that everybody feels like they have a say. And that can be difficult in an online space when you have, you know, me included, there'd be four or more of us. Yeah. It's to make sure everybody's having a say and everybody's feeling like they're part of the session. Mm. And I would imagine that even there would just be logistical things in terms of, um, you know, technology and, um, you know, there being a, a, even just like a slight lag in hearing somebody else and, and that's okay if it's just you and one other person or you and two other people, but the more individuals that includes, I would imagine that, um, you know, there's the the difficulty of, you know, technology and talking over one another and, and things like that that is just easier to navigate in person. Yeah. And when we're talking about counselling skill sets, what we learn yeah. as counsellors, uh, working with a group of people, which would be three or more, there's a lot of dynamics that happen in that space and trying yeah. to manage them with people joining from different computers or are they mm. going to be wedged on the same couch together and yeah. then somebody says something and 
two or three other people want to have a say, they have a response to that. Mm. Um, it has to be quite a controlled environment to make it safe for everybody. Yeah, absolutely. I think people in person, you know, again, talking from the, the skill set side of things, being mm. able to um, facilitate and kind of manage that conversation as it goes along is a lot easier in a physical space together mm. rather than on a screen, other than, you know, you can mute certain people in a group, but that's not always the healthy dynamic. Yeah trying to build so yeah. it's, online can be tricky with bigger groups yeah absolutely mm-hmm. um is there uh space for people to come and talk to somebody who specializes in this area when they might not be part of the relationship it might be my daughter is in an enm relationship and i don't get it or you know, things like that where it's more about, I guess, um, exploration of their own bias or um, thoughts and perceptions, but also some education around what that looks like. Yeah, there's a balance in there somewhere, isn't there? Because it's not up to me to tell you whether these relationship styles are right or wrong for mm. you or your family member or your loved one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, it's still a space that you can be supported, even if you're dead against it, even if you come in and say, my partner, you know, or I just met a new person and they're polyamorous and I adore them and I want to be with them, but I totally hate polyamory. It's not my jam. Yeah. It's not up to me to try and change your mind to be polyamorous. That's not what a a therapist needs to be doing, just like a therapist doesn't need to be trying to convince anyone to be monogamous. Mm um so yeah people can absolutely come into the counseling space at least with me and feel like they're supported in whatever's going on for them even if that means they're not interested in enm mm. that's not a problem either everybody does everybody uh deserves to have that support yeah wherever it's landing for them whatever they think and feel about it yeah absolutely and I think, you know, for for some people, particularly if they might be, a, you know, an older generation or something like that, if their child comes home and says that they are, you know, seeing multiple people, that can be confusing as well. They like even just from a I don't understand that point of view, not a, I'm against that point of view. Um, and there is a lot of information on the internet and not all of it is accurate and not all of it is helpful. And so I would imagine that even being able to go into a um, a space where somebody who specializes in this area might be able to help you understand as well yeah. the, what it is all about as well. Yeah, yeah. and understanding that labeling of different yeah. You know, if it is somebody who's a loved one's just been speaking to them about this and they're not understanding it, Mm. just to help them to get into a space where they maybe can understand that person. Yeah. They don't have to agree with it. You know, again, they don't have to be on board with it. But Mm. to be able to support other people in whatever relationship structure they choose for themselves. Yeah. It's, you know, a really special thing to be able to do for the people that we care about. Mm. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm. Now I am going to get to my favorite part of the podcast, which is what myth you would like to smash. But I actually have a myth that I want to ask you about, which yeah. is yeah. which it. is that often I find and this I do a lot of relationship counseling, so I often find that it comes up in the room a lot in conversation around um, don't you get jealous? Like that concept of yes. of jealousy, um, and and I guess you know I tend to talk about it in the sense that jealousy doesn't actually have to be the evil that it is made out to be. That actually, can't we just understand jealousy and just bring it into the room and talk about it as opposed to making it something that we fear? Um, but is that a common conversation that comes up? It is, and it's one of my favourite topics. And yeah. I'm so glad that you mentioned it. <laughs> the way that I approach it is that jealousy is an emotion, like any yeah. other. It's just trying to tell you something. 
Mm. Um, it's not a bad emotion. It's not yeah. a good emotion. Just like all of our emotions, they're there to try and tell us something, to point something out to us. Yeah. So jealousy will always come from a place of fear. Mm. There'll be something that that person's scared is going to happen or has already happened. There'll be something going on for them that's deeper than just sitting there going, I'm jealous of, of you, of them, of that situation. So in counselling, being able to unpack that and understand it better often takes that fear away from jealousy and the stigma around if you're feeling jealous, there's something wrong with you, you're wrong, you know, you shouldn't be feeling that way. Mm-hmm. And a lot of people in the ENM space, if they're feeling jealous, there's a lot of narrative around it in terms of, well, ENM can't be for you. If you get jealous, mm-hmm. that means you're not good at ENM, you're not a good person. Uh, polyamory partner you you won't work out in the swinging scene whatever it might be for them and it's just not true jealousy is an emotion like any other and if it's coming up for somebody it's always worth trying to understand why is it there what's it trying to tell you mm. yeah jealousy That's- is a fascinating one yeah yeah i mean it it's coming up it's not um enm specific jealousy comes up in every relationship but um, but I, I tend to take a similar approach in that what can we learn from it as opposed to um, just automatically boxing somebody in. Um, but it's interesting that it sort of leads people to think that you can't be good at e like it's a job or a skill um, and not that it's a relationship that has complex emotion and personality and all of those you know, layers to it. Um, I don't think relationships in general, whether they are monogamous or non-monogamous, is something that we should be using good or bad as like a moral compass that we're good or bad at relationships. I think that that tends to just um, shame people into thinking that they're not good enough to, to be in a relationship with um so yeah well, you know I think one of the reasons why jealousy does come up a lot in ENM relationships is again the social idea that monogamy is the only way to to have a relationship yeah that person then somehow belongs to you physically mentally spiritually they're yours you're a pair now and everybody else is an outsider and then shifting into an E&M space where there are other partners involved in some way or another, whatever dynamic it might be, jealousy is going to be a natural thing that comes up because our brains are going, yeah, but here's our one partner, here's our connected person. Mm. You know, these other people might feel like a threat to our relationship or to our emotional safety. Yeah. So, you know, it's it's a very natural, normal emotion to have come up in those types of situations. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. As somebody who works in this space, what is the one myth that comes to mind that you would love to smash about E&M relationships? The people who are in E&M relationships are trying to avoid deeper connections. Mm that somehow if you have multiple partners, that means you're not giving all of them everything. Yeah. That you're not able to meet any of their needs because you're spread too thin. Mm. Um, it's that idea of avoidance. By having multiple relationships, you must be avoiding something about a connected one relationship with somebody. Mm. And whilst there's going to be people out there who do conduct themselves like that, Um, it's been my experience that that is an extremely small minority. Most people in the E&M community are very connected to their partners. Mm. They're able to have deep, meaningful conversations or they at least want to work towards that. Mm. And a lot of work goes into those different dynamics. So, you know, in my experience, it's absolutely not a method for avoiding deeper connection. Most of yeah. And and I would imagine there would also be the misconception that it's about um, fear of commitment or something like that as well, when realistically, I guess we know that people can be, you know, deeply committed to more than one person. But um, I guess, it, you know, it is coming back to that internal narrative of, you know, oh, well, that's not true commitment. And we sort of go, well... What is true commitment? 
you know, what's that mean? Um, yeah. Let's un- let's, you know, let's unpack that. Let's see where that's coming from. Um, but yeah, I um I wholeheartedly agree. I think it's I think it's easy for people to think that something that doesn't fit your uh norm is somehow avoiding the norm by doing that. Um it's I think it just for some people it it makes sense that way. Um, it, it is easier for them to think that than to consider that actually this is um, very okay, that this is, you know, very a, a very healthy, committed relationship, just mm-hmm. like any monogamous relationship as well. Yeah, and I mean not to invalidate the people that are using non-monogamous relationships to avoid connection mm-hmm. because there's obviously something going on for oh. them deeper and yeah. we'll come to that in their own time we can't force people to come to these realizations yeah but, you know if that's where they are in their life that's okay too mm. you know, there's lots of conversations we can have in that space as well it doesn't make them bad people it just means they're in a space at the moment where they can't mm. be in those deeper connections with other people yeah Absolutely. Great, great topic for counselling as well for people to come in and seek counselling for sure. Yes, absolutely. There is never a topic that is not great for counselling. <laughs> That's so true. Just a little plug for our industry. Yeah. There is never an off-limits topic. Um, and I always say that about my practice. Yeah. There's no topic that's off limits because yeah. sometimes people feel uncertain, like, can I bring this up with my therapist? I don't know if they're going to be okay with details about something that I've been up to. Yes. You can say anything. Once we are you- happy for all the details. To- yes, go for it. <laughs> Nothing shocks me. I've heard it all. Yeah. Like- yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Now, before we finish, you have a um, a product for those who are new to non-monogamy, don't you? Yeah, I do. You're so <laughs> funny to mention that. <laughs> I did write a book. Um, it's called The Beginner's Guide to Ethical Non-Monogamy. Um, it's a really great starting point for people that maybe don't know a lot about it or went down that path without sort of understanding it and now they feel a bit stuck. Yeah. Um, it's just a great starting point for anybody that's interested and great for anyone trying to support a family member or a friend in that space as well. Um, what a wonderful resource, not just for those who are, you know, exploring that, but like you said, for those who maybe just want to understand or for therapists who are helping, who do relationship therapy and who need more information or want to understand more what that journey might be like for the couples that they work with. Um, so I think that's a really wonderful resource. Yeah, it was fun to write. As yeah, I bet. Well. It's a topic I get so passionate about because yeah. that's what I work in every day. So yeah. yeah. And it's so diverse. So it would it must have felt like, gosh, I could write, you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pages. <laughs> yeah. And we have to put a like a pin in it somewhere. I yeah. Think, you know, encyclopedia out there for people yeah. just yet. So I'm yeah. sure there'll be, you know, ongoing installments. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm trying to think of what comes after the beginners, but um, the intermediate, <laughs> the intermediate or the advanced guide. Um, there we go. There's a sequel for you. I'll have to get on to it. Um, I will. Um, I'll pop all of those details in the show notes anyway for anybody who wants to either reach out to you or um, grab hold of that resource. Um, I think the more conversations that we can have about anything that just sits outside of what is considered normal in society, whether that be relationships, sexuality, gender, anything that sort of sits outside of that, the more helpful conversations we can have around that, um, the more empathy we can have around that, the more growth that will happen in society. I think until we, until empathy becomes part of the conversation, we're missing, we're missing the mark. So, yeah. Thanks for joining me. Thanks so much for having me on. It's been, it's been so good. We hope you enjoyed joining us inside the therapy room. Thanks for listening. 